and welcome back to the Across the Pod NFL podcast. It's time for another season preview, our fourth team of the season previews this year, and our first team outside of the NFC West. And it's time for the turn of the AFC East and the Buffalo Bills. And of course, had to bring him back for the Bills. It is Charlie Nelson. How are you, mate? I'm really well. Yeah, very good. Um, looking forward to an exciting season. I'm counting down to training camp now. It's uh, not too far away, but the off season is long, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's a it's a tough period, but we're only about two months away from real football. And uh, yeah, I'll, even even preseason, I'll happily watch right now. Yeah, I mean, this podcast will be released um, most likely after training camp starts. But um, see if you're wondering why that was said. But either way, it's an exciting time because we're now at that point where Net from August onwards, we've got football at least every month now until until February. I mean, there's even though I don't think many people actually watch much. Pre- I, mean, I tend to avoid preseason games, to be honest. But at least if you want to watch NFL football, there is something there, something there for you. Um, and before we carry on, if you are watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, Apple Podcast, don't forget to uh, subscribe and follow the podcast. Um, so, yeah, we are here to talk all things Buffalo Bills. Of course, Charlie, we met for the first time in person uh, last year uh, in Detroit. Um, if any of you were listening to my episode where I went through my time in Detroit watching game or even my YouTube video, you'd be aware that Charlie was basically my saviour of the trip because if you don't know my story, if you have heard it, I apologise, I'm repeating the story again, but... I got I got freaky stranded in Buffalo. My bus got cancelled without ten of me. There was no other buses to come. And through Charlie's Twitter um, contacts and Kristen as well, we managed to get a lift to Buffalo. So in the end, Charlie, yeah, I, I was hugely thankful you for, thankful to you well, for um for that. And Bills Mafia are always charitable. That's what we're known for. And uh, even if you're a Dolphins fan, we'll find a way to uh, to help you out. So I was impressed. You know, you stood there in what thousands of Bills fans uh, in enemy territory, and uh, and you were you were welcome with open arms, uh, which was which was you know unsurprising to me, but maybe it's a little surprising to you. And of course, we had David on since that time. David from from that group, I, sp- I spent a few days with. Um, we did um, come on the podcast to review Bills Dolphins after Week 14 last season. And I am going to a Buffalo Bills game this season in Buffalo, which, you know, everyone said about the tailgating being good in Detroit, but when you went, but even better in Buffalo, I'll, I'll be staying at David. So the Bills Mafia, despite the team you've chosen, the team you follow, I think otherwise, very, very good good, good, good group of people. So, um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing David again. And obviously, well, we're mentioning it later on in the episode, but we are, of course, going to London. Or well, you're, you're going to London, the Buffalo Bills. Um, and of course, you'll be there. I'll be there, and a few other Bills fans I met on this trip in Detroit um, will be there. So yeah, exciting times. It certainly is. Yeah, we can't wait. Uh, we got big plans. Um, we've uh, formally uh, incorporated uh, the London Bills Backers Group uh, this year. So, uh, as many people may know, we have a, a Bills Backers Pub in London, and um, we were getting up to about 120 people attending games that towards the end of last season. So, we've actually formally set up London Bills Backers, and uh, along with the uh, friends at UK uh, Bills, we have all kinds of events planned for for Bills Mafia that are coming over and also locals alike. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a boozy long weekend, and uh, I can't wait. I'm interrupting this episode to bring you guys my conversation with Will Bradley, the founder of Fans of Buffalo, a social media based company that takes Buffalo Bill fans to NFL games all over the US all season long. And this year includes their trip to London. I spoke to Will about what the Bills fans are going to bring to the UK NFL experience. Hello, Andy Davis here, and we are joined by Will Bradley, who is the owner of the company called Fans of Buffalo. This is a company that um, is a premier Buffalo sports travel package group bringing Bills fans together on the road. And the reason why I'm here today is to talk more about the Bills' trip to London and the fans from Buffalo, Bills Mafia, that are coming to, in- to England's capital. But before we do all that, how are you, Will? Uh, I'm good. Thanks for having me, Andy. Uh, yeah, it's been crazy. All these Bills fans, they uh, they travel very well already, and everybody's really excited to get to London. So we're putting it together. Yeah, it's going to be a fantastic event. I mean, first time, a second time ever, first time, but I believe since 2015. But before we do all that, um, for you, obviously you're a Bills fan, as, as, as is obvious, but how did sort of the idea of creating the company come about? And did you ever think it would get as big as it has? Um, so we had no idea how big it would be. Um, 
I originally grew up in Buffalo, and then I moved outside the Philadelphia area. Um, that's where I met my partner, Joe, uh, my business partner here. And he actually, he started doing sports trips about 12, 15 years ago um, out of Philly. And then whenever I had free time and he needed help, I would tag along, um, you know, go to new stadiums, checking stuff out. That's That's always fun. And then once he quit his job to do it full time, I'm like, all right, this is this is pretty cool, man. I would love to do this for my bills. And uh, we've talked about it for a few years. Um, then finally in 2020, we decided to go for it. So um, basically we started the company then and they were going to Vegas and we had a lot of people sign up um, just pretty much off of social media and marketing, stuff like that. And then, of course, no fans in the stand during the pandemic. So. Uh, we were excited that we got people to sign up during the pandemic, uh, but we got refunds from all the vendors. So we just gave everybody's money back and just kind of had to pack it in for a year. And then 2021 was our first uh, travel season. And we were blessed with an amazing schedule going to Nashville, New Orleans, and then three Florida cities. And it seemed like people loved the idea um, of putting it all together and making it easy to travel. Um, as I said, you already know Bill's Mafia travels well already. so. Um, people are busy in their, their lives and jobs already, so they can just go to one place saying, hey, Will's going to take care of everything for us and throw some parties over there, and then uh, let's do it. And it seems like uh, people are excited and staying with us. We have a lot of return customers right now. Yeah, and you mentioned, of course, all the places you went to. And, of course, I met you in Detroit uh, around Thanksgiving for the Bills-Lions game last season. But what would you say out of all the ones you've been to so far has been your favorite trip that you've been on with the Bills Mafia? Oh man, that's tough. There, there's there's a lot of fun ones. Um, Miami every year that's turning into bigger and bigger every year. Our first one, I think we had probably seventy five people, and then last year, um, it was almost three hundred people. So that being an annual trip is really cool because we really know the area. Um, I would say so far though, New Orleans is probably up there. Um, we got really lucky. We chartered two flights down there, I guess. That was before inflation because charter flights have not been as cheap. So we filled two flights, and we just had a really big tailgate. Um, New Orleans Bills backers, they're a lot of fun. We did a whole Bills parade. So I would say in all-encompassing, that was probably the most fun. But also L.A., we had 3,000 people at our tailgate with the Bills backers out there. So um, it's definitely tough, but... I would say New Orleans is the top and um, the rest are close second. Yeah, I was going to say New Orleans is certainly a place that you can't forget. I mean, I went there last year and I'll never forget my time there because it is just so... I was there for Halloween, but even so, I imagine the rest of the year you go there and I imagine it's just... it's just, it's just It seems like a crazy place all year round and it really is, you know, they really go all out and I think it's... Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, thought, I think Nashville, I imagine, would have been a good, good place to visit. I mean, I loved my time there. All the all the bars, all the live music. I imagine that's probably quite a good place to go to as well. No, oh, yeah, Nashville. Nashville is a lot of fun. Um, I could be basing it on the outcome of the game as well. In Nashville, we um, pretty much had our heart taken out from a last minute loss, but we won big in New Orleans, and that was um, over Thanksgiving actually. But yeah, both cities are really fun, and it's really cool when you can mix both a fun trip with a good destination city like that. Um, both it just seems like the party never stops from the moment you step off the bus or um or plane and you just get right after it. And a lot of Bills fans they like to have a good time. Yeah, they certainly do. I mean, I left my time with the Bills Mafia uh last season and I will be going to Buffalo this season. So I'm looking forward to experiencing a home game this year. Um looking forward to seeing how they how they party. You can I also I met um Loads of Bills fans there, including David and Kristen, are, t- are telling me that if I think it's crazy in Detroit on Thanksgiving, just you wait to see a home game. And I- I'm looking forward to seeing what that is like, even if I hope they lose. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you're in You're in for a good game no matter what. Yeah. Or a good time, at least. Maybe not the game uh, if you're not rooting for the Bills. But, um, yeah, Orchard Park is uh, pretty crazy on game day. You can get there pretty much as early as you want. And the party starts and... You don't really even have to know anybody. You can just show up, start walking around. You'll get invited places, and everybody want to hear your story and just kind of chop it up. Um, that's what I love about football. Kind of just 
puts everything else in the world that separate separates us away for a time and we can just come together and have some fun. So um definitely let me know when you're up in Buffalo. So that'll be a good time. Yeah, definitely. It'll be for the, the Buccaneers game on Thursday. So I don't really I'm gonna think of it going into the game with much expectation of half a Bill's loss, but um, <laughs> it should be good anyway to experience yeah. that. Um but of course of course, the main talking point of this episode is going to be all about your time in London. So, of course, Bills are one of the, the three uh, home teams for the 2023 International Series in London. Of course, they are hosts of the Jacksonville Jaguars, who are making history by becoming the first team to play two regular season games in the same place outside of the US. So, in terms of that, how's the planning been in terms of going to the UK rather than rather than the US. Is it does it change a lot or is it just still the same process? You're still booking flights, still booking hotels, or does it change at all the fact that it's not in the US? Um so I would say I'm glad that we've kind of had a good kind of track record of doing these trips under our belt. A lot of it is close to the same, um, but it's just kind of a whole new beast. Um it's good though because I would say uh when Bills do go to Super Bowl uh, as big as that trip is, I'll I'll be ready for it. Um, you can throw anything at us, and we'll do it. But uh, basically, it's doing the same things, but just kind of having to take a couple extra steps to understand a new place. Obviously, with international travel alone, is a lot for a lot of people, um, and they just do things differently in London than we do in America. Even just kind of the hotel rooms and figuring out that they're not the same size and. Um, everybody should be prepared for that. And you're not really going to find too many with two beds and um, one room. Unlike America, you can find that everywhere. So it's just a lot of little speed bumps here and there. But we've taken our time and we have a lot of good friends in the travel industry. And um, one of the big things we, we tell is we like to do a lot of research. So um, we usually would have the rest of our travel season out. But because of London, we've just kind of really wanted to give each one our time after we gave London everything we could. So, um, yeah, we, I think we've put a lot of good stuff together thus far, and I think it's going to go really well. And how many roughly is sort of expected to go on the trip with you guys? Um, so we had no idea to start. Uh, I was saying when we released our priority deposits, which is before we know the dates or prices uh, for the really crazy fans that just know they're going to go no matter what. Um, I was hoping for 150 people tops, uh, for that at least and saying, Hey, we'll work with 200 for a group over there. I'd be really happy. Um, we set the website to 500 deposits and sold out in about a month. So we were like, let's stop there and regroup, make sure, uh, we have everything we need. And we basically just reached back out and just opened up our availability. Um, and we just said, Hey, let's get after it. So. Right now, we have uh, close to 600 people signed up after um, a lot of people, some people did cancel once they got the price and dates, didn't work out. Uh, so the 600 that are signed up are pretty much definitely going to go. And then I'd say we have space for close to 1,000 when it's all said and done. Um, I could easily see us hitting that 900 to 1,000 people total as a group. So it's going to be a crazy time out there. It's going to be great because... Obviously, the one thing London has a lot of times, which is has its pros and cons, is the fact that you do see most of the time every NFL jersey available. You see a Cardinals, Titans. Most teams you will see uh, in on display in London from UK fans. But I do think we saw with the Packers last year that because it was their first time in London, a lot of people were in green and yellow. And I think that what we'll see with the Bills fans, not just because the fan base is so good, but also the fact that the Bills have only been London once before. So I do think we're going to get, it's going to be like a sea of blue. Um, and I do think the Jaguars, because they're playing the week before and they're sort of, they're, even in a London team, that I think there's definitely a lot more teams that are more followed. Like the 49ers, the Bears, the Dolphins are definitely more followed than the Jaguars. So I, I do think that when you, when you come to this game, it's going to be just a sea of Bills fans. And I do think that's going to make it almost really feel like a home game because sometimes these London games you have you see every jersey on display it doesn't really feel like a home advantage but I think even though the Jags are London's team and they'll have a week extra to prepare with jet lag etc I I do feel that what we'll see is a lot more Bills fans because I think there'll be a lot of UK fans that'll be eager to see them play who haven't seen them play before because of the travel to US factor I think we'll see that and Jags play every year so fans probably don't 
I'm as excited as Bill fans would be. So for those who are listening who maybe aren't familiar with the Bills Mafia uh, or anything like that, just tell us what can people expect from the Bills Mafia when they come to London for, for the game? Uh, pretty much Bills Mafia, uh, the reason they call it Mafia because it is just like a huge family. Um, you really just have to – you get it when you're at home. Um, obviously, everybody – and the hometown is going to be majority uh, fan of the home team. But once you leave and you go across the country, um, go to other cities, um, it's just amazing the support that they have everywhere in the U.S., honestly. Um, I know there's always a lot of jokes about the weather up there, but I think you do get a lot of transplants. A lot of people grow up and say, all right, I'm going to try something new. Uh, but they always stay a Bills fan. So um, one of the cool things about the actual team, uh, the Bills, they support – uh, the fans that are everywhere and they're called Bill's backers. So pretty much if you want to get together and find a couple of friends and other people in your city that are uh, fans of the Bills and watch the game together, um, you can start your own chapter and uh, the actual team will recognize you and you'll be, get put on their website. So um, I don't think there's many NFL teams that do that. Um, that's kind of just built like a really huge brand um just through that and i do know that there's uk bills backers we've been working with them um there's italy bills backers they're coming uh, we've been talking to them there's even a london group because they've grown so big um that's separate from the uk so um i think just expect some crazy bills fans that are probably some of the nicest people you ever meet and uh uh they might even if you root for the other team they'll still invite you and they'll have a great time with you but uh, they do love their team. Once you get in the game, it might get pretty loud to be sitting next to them. Before we, before we do go, um, just we'll give you the chance, Will, just to uh, promote those who aren't aware yet of Fans of Buffalo. How can we find uh, Fans of Buffalo on social media? Um, so we're we're on most of the major ones. We're uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, all at Fans of Buffalo. Um, and go to our website, fansofbuffalo.com. Um, you'll see our trips there. When we do start releasing tailgates, um, we always do a three, four hour pregame tailgate on the road where we try to take care of everything you need um, as if you're at a home game. Since you can't take everything with you, we bring in a caterer uh, for a buffet and then we have an open bar there. We usually get some furniture, tents, tables and chairs for everybody. If you're going to break them, um, you got to bring your own for that, I will say. Uh, I know Bills fans are crazy, but um, and then we get a DJ and sometimes a live band, so we just try to make a big party um, before the game and have a good time. But you can find us all across the social media, just at Fans of Buffalo. Um, and I think we're doing seven trips this year, so we'll be all over. If you're in any of those cities on our website, definitely uh, check us out and send me an email or shoot me a call, and definitely can help you out. And what are those cities you're going to this year? Which are the games that you're you're visiting this year? Um, so I should know that off the top of my head, but it's London, uh, DC to start, Philly, Kansas City, Cincinnati, um, and you go to LA and then Miami, I believe that's them. So um definitely a stacked list there, and it's gonna be pretty much all year round. This year it's a little bit more spaced out, which is nice. Last year we had a lot of I think three trips back to back to back at one point, especially with the Detroit game getting moved. So, um, yeah, we got a full slate and we're all, we're going to be everywhere and we're very excited and a lot of big things in a lot of places. I want to say it's the, I know your last time was it, I believe it's 2015, 2014, your 2015. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's yep. your second ever time playing in London. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. yep. The first one was also against the Jags and it was an absolute heartbreaker uh, defeat in the uh, the final minutes. So, yeah, I'm hoping for a better result this time. <laughs> well, it just shows why the NFL is so great. The fact that I said this before, but you could be punished for being a glory hunter, i.e. Giants fans who picked them in maybe in the late 2010s or early 2010s and Patriots fans now who are suffering. And on the flip side, when you know you guys played last played in London, I mean, who would have thought that you, the Chiefs and the Bengals would be the three Probably the three favourites, I'd say, for the um for the AFC crown. So it's um you know it'll be a far different prospect to um to last year. And, uh, sorry, last time you were in London. And of course you're going to the game. Um, whereabouts are you sitting? Do you know where your seat is roughly? 
Uh, roughly, yes. Yeah. So I actually, because of I knew that there was going to be a lot of demand for tickets, and having had the stress of trying to get Giants and, and Packers tickets last year, I decided to actually uh, sp- splash out and get a hospitality ticket. So I'm in the I'm in the two hundreds. I'm sort of level with the end zones, not the super super fancy tickets, but quite fancy tickets, uh, and that meant that I didn't have the stress of of competing with the other four hundred thousand people that were trying to get a ticket um, when they went on sale. So of course, you know, the Jags are a good team now. It's two playoff teams. I think it's one of the biggest games that London's actually staged uh, in the Bills and Jags in terms of where those those two teams are and their relative uh, yeah, abilities. So um, yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, you know, maybe I'll get a free drink and some free food as well as a very <laughs> expensive seat. Yeah, you think with the price, I mean, I've seen some of the prices that you can pay for for, for different sports, for hospitality sections yeah. and games. And yeah, I, I think that's the least you, um, you're owed. But um it's still yeah. a lot cheaper than a trip to Buffalo. Um, although I am also making that um, this year. Um, so I just kind of justify the bases. They only come very, very infrequently. So uh, I can uh, splash out from time to time. And which game is that you're going to in Buffalo? So I'm actually going to see them play the Dolphins uh, the week oh, before right. the Bills travel to uh, to London. And then the week before that, I will be in Washington to see them play uh, the Commanders. So I've got three games in a row. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's exciting times. And I managed to sort of coordinate a bit of work with uh with the games so yeah it's going to be uh a pretty 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 expensive <laughs> but hopefully really good fun uh, few weeks yeah hopefully three losses as well um <laughs> <laughs> we'll see but yeah I- i'm looking forward to seeing the build in london i mean i thankfully for a friend of the podcast luke campbell uh one of our best fans who should be on for our best season preview in august when that's released um he thankfully had two spare season tickets and he could make the game um, so yeah, I got his ticket. A um, bit more price than I paid for the Ravens Titans game, uh, probably double. But it's um, the seats <laughs> are incredible. And when I saw the seat he had, I thought to myself, you know what? I've got to do this at least once because these seats are like right on the corner of the end zone and about I want to say maybe six or seven seats from the from the from the bottom row. So it's going to oh, right, great. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I go from that to my in the God seat in a week later, I think it's going to be quite a shock. But um, what, It's funny you say that. Oh, you know, you and I met in Detroit and that was the Thanksgiving game. Mm. But the week before that, the Bills played uh, the Browns in Detroit as well due to all the snow, which of course caused you problems as well. Yeah. And that was a game that was moved from Buffalo. And uh, of course, most many people from Buffalo couldn't make it. So they basically put the tickets out and they put them out for pretty cheap. I think I paid $40 for 50 yard line uh, seats. I think they were 20 rows back and that'll be the cheapest I ever pay for an NFL <laughs> ticket, I think. So <laughs> think yeah, exactly, cool. exactly. And the same wasn't quite full, uh, but it was, uh, it was, it was close too. but it was, uh, yeah, it was just one of those emergency shifted games at the last minute. And it was just a question of who else can make it. I was fortunate that I could change my travel plans and still get there, but, yeah i mean now these days i mean the hospitality the spurs is starting at 300 uh, pounds and um the bills tickets are going up every time i go it gets more and more expensive because they're good um you know that's the, that's the thing about uh, american sports is it's priced uh, it's like a market economy it's not quite different to, uh, to soccer here mm. yeah I, I agree um of course i mentioned before we went to the game on thanksgiving uh, i was actually very near you speaking of seats uh, i remember actually i could see you from my seat from the time, <laughs> time i was i was watching you for your reaction i think i was for me, that's probably the best ever game I've been to for actually how the game goes. It was, oh, a, it was a great game. game. Yeah. It was a great game. So I remember at time time, I remember watching your reactions when Detroit scored. I mean, I, I was cheering on Detroit, I'm not gonna lie. So when I was jumping up cheering on the Detroit Lions, it was um it was funny seeing your reaction because I could see you getting quite um, getting quite stressed. <laughs> it was very stressful. And of course there was that incredible Stefan Diggs catch towards the yeah. end and set up a yeah. last uh, minute field goal. So yeah, it was a really exciting game. Uh and it felt it was like a sort of you know walking architect that game really for us. So uh, but you know the Lions are a good team now and uh, no mugs and uh, it was I'm just happy to come away with a win, that was for sure. I don't know whether you've been to a game on Thanksgiving before in Detroit, but what was your? You've been to a few. I have been to a Thanksgiving games. game, but not not in Detroit. Um, okay. But... Yeah. Uh, so actually, I, I attended the Bills playing um, the Saints. Uh, oh, yeah. I think it was one year before in in New Orleans, and that was oh, incredible okay. because Bills Mafia pretty much took over New Orleans, and um, I mean that's a great city anyway. But you know. Bourbon Street, which is sort of the main drag there, where all the sort of partying happens, which is full of Bills Mafia, and the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. Um, Detroit had sort of a slightly different vibe because it, you know it's, it's winter, it's, everyone's outside, um, it, you know it's a bit too cold, so everyone's inside. So it tended to be a little bit more low key, uh, but still great fun. I mean, everybody's dressed up, and um, I don't know, it's got a got a, a good different kind of feel of it. Thanksgiving game. 
Yeah, it was it was good. I mean, I um I I wasn't that keen on the Bebe Rexa performance. Um, the a part of a half. No, that was a bit weird. <laughs> yeah. I don't get why half half. I swear she wasn't even visible for the fans. Only only visible via a um like a screen. I don't get what that really super uh, family friendly either. You know, given it's such yeah. a big family day, <laughs> it was a strange one. That's for sure. Yeah, and um, I, I I think she got booed, didn't she as well? Which is I think deserved in the end. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Let's head to the Buffalo Bills and your off season. So, the yeah. main things and outs. Um, let's go to the outs first. Um, so main outs include a lot, a lot of wide receivers have gone, albeit none of them are really big parts of the offense in recent times. Like John Brown, Cole Beasley, Isaiah McKenzie, and Jameson Crowder. Uh, but the main Roger Saffold, one of your guards, has gone as well. But uh, obviously, Devin Singletary and Tremaine Edmonds to the Bears are the sort of the main two highlight. Uh, it, of the outs and then the ins include Trent Sherfield via the Dolphins, wide receiver, uh, running back Damon Harris, guard Connor McGovern, safety Taylor Rapp, uh, running back Latavius Murray, who is bound to get a, another touchdown in London, um, cornerback Cameron Dantzler and offensive tackle Brandon Shell, who again is another former Dolphin. And in the draft, uh, Dalton Kincaid, 25th overall, a tight end. Uh, 59th overall, you took guard Osiris Torrent and then 91st overall, you took Dorian Williams, the linebacker. So, as a whole, what's your take been on the um, incomings and outcomings at the uh, Bills this offseason? Yeah, so I think it's uh, undoubtedly a better team than it was last year. There was a lot of people concerned about what would happen with the offensive line, a lot of people concerned about um, what we'd do on the defensive line. Uh, Ed Oliver was up for a, for a contract, and um, we paid him. Not necessarily huge, huge money, but we did pay him. The big Obviously, gap is Tremaine Edmonds. I mean, he's been our starting middle linebacker for what, five seasons, and we just couldn't afford to pay him. He basically played himself out of the bills. Um, he was getting up to a sort of 18 million a year in terms of contract work value, and we just didn't have the cap space to, to invest in that. And I think like a lot of teams, we decided where, where can you go a little cheaper than linebacker is one of those, one of those places. We're already paying Matt Milano, um, who's sort of pro bowl level uh, linebacker, and um, we couldn't pay two guys there. So instead, what they've tried to do is to compensate, is to beef up the uh, the D-line with um, uh, Leonard Floyd and, and Puna Ford, which I think are really great additions. I think that D-line is massively improved, and I think it will cover in case there's you know, prolonged uh, absence still by Von Miller and see how long it takes him to get back. They've also got some players coming back from from injuries and people like Micah Hyde, Trey White should be fully fit this year. I think the addition of Taylor Rapp is a really smart one for the safety group. So that secondary is is, is really stacked. I mean, you're looking at uh, Kyrie, uh, who's a former you know, first round pick, you had uh, Travis White. Um, then you've got uh, the Poyer and Hyde, the, the sort of safety duo back with, with Rapp as, as an option. So it's just a really, really stacked secondary. And of course, the big big change for us of course is that McDermott's taking over the defense so Leslie Frazier has left uh, and no one's quite sure exactly how that came about but um, the defense has typically played very well but when been found out in the playoffs and I suspect we'll see going to see a more aggressive uh, defense under McDermott similar to what he, we, we saw when he was at uh, at the Eagles so in terms of the off the defense I mean there's one big hole in Tremaine Edmonds but I think the, around that we've got to look, feel pretty confident I think it is a better defense it's a fitter defense and hopefully if we can stay a bit healthier this year that's going to be fantastic on the offensive side of the ball, I think the, the big news, obviously, is Dalton Kincaid coming in. I mean, this is a shift in, in tactics. You mentioned all those wide receivers that have stepped out. I think that Dalton Kincaid, by the end of the season, will become the de facto wide receiver, too. That's what this team has been crying out for. I think he'll be a fantastic underneath threat, that sort of um, big slot option. He, you know, he's much more of a wide receiver than he is a sort of blocking tight end. Uh, but having him and Dawson Knox, I think, is going to create some great mismatches. And then, of course, what they've done is to change up the uh, the running back room quite a bit. So Devin Singletary been, you know, a stalwart of that room for a while. Not spectacular, but perfectly very solid, very serviceable NFL um, uh, running back. But what they've done is to bring in um, um, Damien Harris and and um, and uh, who am I, who am I missing uh, on the running back room? Oh, of course, Latavius Murray. You know, to, to back him up. I, I think Damien Harris Harris is a really smart move. I think he's going to be that short yardage um downhill back to complement a really exciting player in james cook 
Um, so I think it's a better balanced running back room. And I think that the criticism with Harris has always been, can he stay fit? Well, and now we have little Murray, who's always delivers wherever he goes to, to back him up. Uh, and then there's uh, Naeem Hines, who you know, didn't really get into the, the team on a, in an offensive capacity last year, only more on special teams. But I think it's a really balanced running back room. To, and that's going to help out Josh Allen tremendously. So uh, that, there's one big hole we have at right tackle. Um, we have Spencer Brown still there, uh, our, our third round draft pick. Um, and no one's quite sure how that's going to play out. So it's quite good to see they've actually put some energy into guard. So to bring in Osiris Torrance, I think he's going to be more of that Mauler style, opening up gaps uh, rather than that sort of zone zone kind of guy. Um, and I think that's a, that's a nice addition. So everybody feels quite a lot happier with the offensive line, apart from Spencer Brown. And of course, he still has the physical traits to, uh, to, to, kind of, to improve. But um, I think the wide receiver room might still be missing a guy. But I mean, you can tell me more about Trent Sheffield and, and whether he's going to be a sort of uh, a decent maybe wide receiver for. Um, Quite happy with uh, with the addition of um, uh, of oh, skip, give me out there, Dante Hardy. Um, you know, he's obviously had some injury problems, but I think he could be that uh, an upgrade over uh, uh, McKenzie. I think he's you know he's that shifty guy. He's quick. He's small, but I think he's going to be uh, a better a better fit for us. So what we've seen is sort of the base of that wide receiver room come up. Um, an addition of Dalton Kincaid, I think, is going to complement Diggs very nicely. Um, but yeah, maybe we're a wide receiver it's short, but um, I still think it's quite a big step forward from where we were a year ago. Yeah, I'm mean, going on Trent Sherfield. Um, yeah, there's looking at his stats now, as you mentioned him, um, career year in terms of most targets, most receptions, most yards, most touchdowns, etc. And I must admit, I think that obviously he was never going to be the main guy in, in Miami because you've got obviously Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle, but I think yeah. that he was a good choice at third receiver. I mean, but if I'm honest, there was really no one else really doing it either. So there's not, so I don't think he really did a lot to get to that third receiver role. I mean, I'd love to see Mike Gesicki being used more as like that kind of slot receiver role, but that's not to be sadly. But I think, um, which you could see with Dawson, um, with uh, Dawson Kin- Kincaid, but I think with Sherfield, I think, he made some great plays. I mean, uh, the 49ers game uh, with the week 13, week 14, where she first played the game, he scored a touchdown. And I think that Tua did a now and again, he did lean to him a lot of times when Hill and Waddle were struggling to get, you know, get targets or they were in double coverage, for example. So I think that he's a good guy to have as your third or fourth choice receiver. But I don't think if you're wanting to be a number one or number two, I think that's probably a, a bit too far of a stretch. Yeah. I don't think that's what we need him. I think a bit of special team support as well. I think we'll, we'll expect to see from him. But yeah, he's like it's obviously a slightly bigger bodied guy. Um, we've also brought in a, um, you know another um, uh, wide receiver as well in, in in the shape of sorry drafted a wide receiver um to to complement that room and no one's really quite sure how this wide receiver room is gonna gonna play out and obviously the stefan Diggs and gabe davis i think that what we'll probably see is that the targets for gabe davis will start to drop as um dalton kincaid gets more embedded into the offense i think you know he will be used as a as a, as a wide receiver uh then we've got uh justin shorter who's the other draft pick that we brought in you know he's a, he's a bigger body guy he might be our wide receiver six no one's quite sure what role he's going to play um we still have clearly Shakir uh, on the books, who I really like. I think he's a solid slot. So what we've got is, I think, a really good wide receiver one. We've got a wide receiver three in, in Gabe Davis. You know, hopefully Sheriff, uh, um, Kincaid's going to come in as our essentially our wide receiver uh, two. And then we've got a, a whole heap of guys who are going to be sort of uh, sharing uh, snaps and targets. Uh, and I think that level in terms of, you know, we removed Beasley and Brown and, um, um, uh, and, and McKenzie. Uh, I think that that base level is going to go up. So I think that's going to help help Josh Allen, especially with the improvements on the offensive line as well and, and improvements in the running back room. So I think it's actually exciting. I think this is still a really good football team. And um, you know, everyone was sort of concerned about our cap space and whether we'd be able to actually turn out something that was as good as last year. Honestly, I think it's a better roster. I think it's a deeper roster. I think it's a more balanced roster and it's going to give us more options on offense with, uh, with two tight end sets. Now, you've mentioned the offense. You've mentioned mm-hmm. Josh Allen and you mentioned Stefan Diggs. And that is a... Great segue into our first talking point really is all about what's going on recently with Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen. Now, recently, Josh Allen's come on the podcast. I believe it was Busting with the Boys. Maybe it was Pat McAfee. Yeah, Busting with the Boys, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how it's all it's all been it's blown over, blown out of proportion. But at the same time, we saw 
in our in our in front of our own eyes what happened last season in the divisional round against the Bengals. And there was a clear um, sort of disagreement between both of them. And it sort of carried on to what's happened this off season. And he didn't come into train into the facilities and stuff like that. And you know, as well as the fact that you know we've got Hill and Waddle, the Jets have now got Rodgers. And I, does that concern you at all? The fact that you've still only got really one great receiver, but also the fact that it could be potentially a situation where a dynamic where they are potentially not getting on and that could potentially affect the team. What's your take being on the whole, the whole drama? Yeah. With Allen? I mean, I think that the question is no one really knows exactly what the background is, but I think those of us who have been paying attention have a suspicion. We understand the background. What happened um, before the bye week for, for the bills is that Josh Allen got an injury last year and it, it seemed to affect his ability to throw shorter, shorter, shorter passes. And you see this in terms of the stats, he went from, you know, being pretty uh, mixed in terms of short, medium and longer distance passing to really being quite focused on longer, term, long, longer distance stuff. And that was a lot more targets to Gabe Davis um, and Diggs, seem to be the guy who suffered from that that shifting game planning uh which of course is is disappointing and even the um uh the game against the browns in detroit i was there and i, I mentioned i was 20 rows back actually there was a disagreement there so the digs was talking to mcdermott and uh, there was some kind of that it felt like mcdermott was calming digs down because digs somebody wasn't getting targets and uh, i think that there seemed to be a, a some kind of gap between the game planning with regard to Ken Dorsey and Josh Allen and, 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 and Stefan Diggs in terms of how we involve Diggs in the game. And you see his targets drop quite considerably after this, this, this injury happened. And essentially Josh was playing hurt. So the suspicion is that uh, Stefan was upset with this and wanted to be more involved in the game planning and then, you know, essentially getting more targets. And I think he deserves to be involved in the game planning. Um, and it, you, you got the sense also from Josh Allen's press conference where he said, you know, this is really about communication. It's about, you know, can we as, a, as an organization, including him, communicate better? And um, there's been numerous reports saying, uh, Stefan Dick doesn't have an issue with Ken Dorsey. He was obviously a first time offensive coordinator last year. So that gives me some hope that this can be calmed down and, and, and dealt with. What my frustration is that, you know, I feel like it could have been dealt with way before it, it actually seemed to blow up. You know, they, they came up to OTAs and um, it seemed to, be then being addressed i think and then there's something on mcdermott and on Diggs and on allen to actually have dealt with this well before that um but stefan's a very very passionate player it, it's been known that he's not trying to angle out he doesn't have an issue with with dorsey he tends to keep his counsel but he also likes to put all the sort of you know uh, nuanced messages out on instagram and things sort of implying things without really telling you anything i think my gut feel is it will get sorted out um, I think Josh will be fit and I think we'll see that Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs connection again this year. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm quite optimistic that this will be resolved. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the, the dead cap situation means the bills really cannot get out of Stefan Diggs contract. They're not going to trade him. Um, he's pretty much locked into the bills for another two years. So they have to find a way of resolving it. And, and he's such a superstar and he's, he's such a great player that you have to find ways of getting him involved. And uh, I think they will. Um, I think this is an organization that wants to win and, uh, you know, having Stefan Biggs as a big part of your offense is going to be a, go a long way to, to dealing with that. But yes, you're right. If, if this does blow up, then we have a massive hole at, um, at a, a wide receiver. But what I would say is that although Stefan Diggs' his targets dropped dramatically in the second half of last season, the stats for Josh Allen and this Bills offense were still very, very good. It was, I think, the second highest ranked um, offense um, by most uh, stats statistics. So what they did is they adjusted to Josh's injury, played in a different style, um, and they still were effective. So I think it can adapt, but obviously you'd always rather have Stefan Diggs on your roster than not. I think as well, my only concern was that as well, the fact that we saw how his time in Minnesota ended. Mm. Um, we saw his situation with Kirk Cousins, and I think there's... Obviously, he's got history of it he's as got well. History, yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a concern in that sense. But if you can get him even half of what he's normally like, you obviously have got a great receiver there. So I think you know, I think what I am sure if you win games, it will all be you know because right exactly. now win, winning solves everything. Yeah, 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 winning solves everything. And I, I, I'm I'm sure in the off season this is going to get resolved. I mean, the other thing I'd say is that. There's a reason why wide receivers are known as the sort of divas in in in, in the NFL, right? It, that's the position. It's the ones that uh, have they have the egos. They need to have the egos to be able to be what they are. So, um, yeah, I, I think it comes with the territory of having a, a star wide receiver, honestly. Yeah, I think as well. The most recent memory of a game is the loss. I think as soon as you start the next yeah. season, you go I don't know five and one, four and two, six and zero, oh, whatever. And you have a good start to the year. I think that'll be completely resolved. And I think once he starts 
catching touchdowns again and getting targets again, I think exactly. you'll, it'll be absolutely fine. Um, we talk about winning, and that's my next point, really, is all about your head coach, Sean McDermott, because mm. he's done a great job for you. He is by far your best coach since Jim Kelly days, et cetera, et cetera. But um, he's done so well. He got you the first playoff game in years in the twenty was it 2017 season, 2016 season, whenever mm-hmm. it was, when um, Andy Dalton basically got you to the playoffs. Yep. He's done so well getting you to divisional rounds twice, conference championship once. But the downside to that is that he hasn't yet won the big game. Like, so he lost the Chiefs in the championship game. A year later, you had the... Um, 13 seconds game against mm-hmm. the Chiefs and obviously last season was a really a underwhelming performance against the Bengals. Do you think there's a chance that maybe McDermott has been a good coach, but do you think maybe is he lacking that ability to go the next step and actually take you guys to the promised land? No, I don't have any concerns at all about McDermott. I mean, he's he perfect? Absolutely not. Um, but it's very difficult to find coaches that are better than McDermott's that are, that are stable that are going to deliver 13 win seasons year after year uh, that's what, what McDermott's doing um, to be able to adapt to the horror year that the Bills had last year with having games moved obviously the DeMar Hamlin um, uh, health issue I mean that really shook up the Bills and I think that had a massive amount to do with the performance that everybody saw against Cincinnati. I think that the, the team was just broken mentally as much as anything else. You know, they watched a teammate of theirs die on the field. I think that does something to a team. And um, I think that, uh, you know, we also had massive injuries in, in Von Miller and and, uh, and Micah Hyde, uh, Trey White not really being 100% coming back, and then an injury to Josh Allen. I think you add all these things up, then it actually kind of makes sense why they would have dropped off so sharply. Um, the thing about McDermott is he learns from his mistakes, and he learns every year. And I think as, as people that watch him very closely, we can tell that he's got better year after year and that, you know, in the past maybe wasn't so good with his, uh, with his game tactics and, 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 uh, and the strategies and they seem to have improved. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see how his defense works under him versus under Leslie Frazier. Um, but I mean, if you're going to replace him, who do you replace him with? You know, who's available and better than Sean McDermott right now? Is he the absolute top deer in the Andy Reid sort of level? And uh, no, he's not. Um, but actually, if you look at his statistics since um, uh, since taking over in the last sort of five years or so, I think he's he's right up there with Andy Reid in terms of, of most wins and, and, and best records. He has also beaten the Kansas City Chiefs twice in Kansas City, just, just so everybody knows. Yes, the playoffs, we've had various things that have kind of uh, caused us some problems, but the playoffs is a knockoff con- not competition um and you know not the best team doesn't always win the super bowl the, the 13 second year probably we were the best team i i felt like we were in, in the nfl i don't think we were last year i think certainly the bengals and and, and chiefs and, and eagles were better but we're, we're pretty close and i think that you can go chasing this mythical coach who's going to take you to the promised land but who is actually better and available than Sean McDermott. You need to be very careful what you wish for. And then the Bills, you know, having been through 20 years of misery and whatever it was, 17 odd years of missing the playoffs, I think we have, um, we're welcoming the ability to have a bit of stability and be competing and be there and thereabouts every single year. And, and to be in one of the toughest divisions um, in, in football now, it's going to be fascinating to see how, how he reacts to that. But I mean, he has a pretty good record against Belichick. And um, uh, I think uh, he stands up against most most other coaches in the league when you really put his record up against them. Yeah, I do think you're totally right. And I do agree with what you're saying, because even though it's gone from eighth championship game to winning a diff- to two divisional round losses, I think at the same time, NFL is all about stability because you got to learn, if you get a new coach in, it's a brand new playbook, it's a brand new coaching staff. And you got the coach has got, got to have, has got have time to basically get used to the players and how each player operates. Whereas if you've got a guy that, is stable. He knows the offense. He's been there for years, and all the guys are still there. I, I think. I think you're right, but I do think that the one thing that may go against him this year probably might be the division more than um division's the nightmare. Probably yeah, more yeah. than the conference itself because that's a <laughs> that's a tough division. Probably is now the best the best division in the NFL. I think so. I think it's a really difficult division. I think the only um, sort of safe, sight saving grace is the fact that I think. The, it's not like the Bengals and the Chiefs have easy divisions either. Um, so actually, just look out for the Jags. They might be right up there competing for the one seat. They're the one with the, the divisions. That's probably the easiest, which would be kind of crazy, right? But if you actually look at the divisions, um, uh, the throws, those three divisions are actually really tough. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, it's interesting. I mean, 
nobody really knows what's going to happen with the Jets. I mean, we kind of know roughly what the what the Dolphins are, um, but nobody knows what this version of the Jets will be. No one really knows how long it's going to take for for Rogers and his and his uh, his offense to get um, acclimatized. But the Jets did beat us last year without Aaron Rodgers, so um, you cannot you have to take them seriously. But I think the consistency could be an issue for the Jets. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I see them competing for the division this year. I think it's going to be a Bills Dolphins uh, fight primarily, and I think the early early weeks will be very telling for the Jets and how quickly Rogers can really get acclimatized. And you know, we've seen Rogers. He's a he's a prickly prickly character. When things don't go his way, he tends to sort of throw his toys out of the pram a little bit and um he only really has one maybe two seasons to to have an impact so um it, it, i don't know I, i'm 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 not convinced that this is the perfect move for the jets if i'm honest i think uh, we will wait and see on that maybe it's a, it's a swing for the fences but it's also high risk and uh, i think the stability that the, the bills and the dolphins have is going to count in the end yeah, I mean, whilst I do, um, I do actually think the Jets will win a division. I think at the same time, it could go completely the other way. A bit like Russell Wilson last year, what we saw in Denver. And I think, I said it before in our previous episodes, I do think that this year we'll know whether last season was Rodgers getting old or whether it was mm. him not being happy in Green Bay. And I think it will be a real big test. I think if he struggles this year, we'll, and that's with Hackett, who was his OC in back yeah. his MVP years, I think if he can struggle this year, and they put all their eggs in this one basket. It's a two-year window, I'd say, for them to try and win something. If he doesn't perform this year, then I think that this Jets team could be could be could be effective for years and years. It's, it's a great roster. I mean, that Jets team is really a really good roster. That defense is excellent. Um, but I just you see this when quarterbacks move, it doesn't always click straight away. And he, even if he takes him three or four games to get going, that may not that may be just all the issue that they need to not be able to keep up with the with the Finns and the and the Bills. Um, it's such a competitive division. I mean, there is a chance that this this division just sort of cannibalizes it, itself and uh, everybody's uh, yeah. beating everybody else. And it's just you know it's one on a, on ten wins or something. Um, that's that's entirely possible. But I mean, I saw Rogers play twice last year, and um, you know against the 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 Giants and obviously against the Bills and he didn't look all that so um, he did definitely look a little bit old he looked slow time will tell just how well the Rodgers experiment will work out but I think at the very least I'm not expecting a hot start out of them and I think that uh, that will be the difference between them being able to compete with the Bills and Dolphins and just falling short yeah, I agree. And I think that I still think there's a chance that they could they could win the division, but at the same time, there's another chance where it could be like last year you had in Green Bay. But even then, they still managed to, you know, be one game away from the playoffs despite all the turmoil last year. So I think um adding a team with, you know, one of the best defenses last year, if you got Brees Hall healthy for the whole year, I think that also affects the Jets because they were flying high the, the first half of the season. So I think you add someone like Rodgers, and who I, you know, I still think is, I mean, maybe we did it in our quarterback rankings episode. He's still, for me, a top six quarterback in the league. And I think you put him in a team that got seven wins with Zach Wilson, Trevor Simeon, and Joe Flacco, and Mike White. I think that this team can go, I think, at least playoffs. And I think that the division obviously won't help because it's a tough division. But I, I, I am convinced they will win the division. But, you know, it all depends on. I mean, we all said the same thing about Brady when he first came to Tampa Bay. Is it going to work? And obviously that proved to be proved to be right. And same as Matt Stafford. So, yeah, I think it, it could go one or two ways. It could go like Tom Brady or it could go like Russell Wilson. And I think time will tell on that. And speaking of which, we're going to head to our final segment, which is going to be the win-loss-tie section. So if you don't know the, the score by now, we give each fan list of every game their team plays and they have to answer with a win, loss or tie answer. Now, Charlie, you were on the podcast last year and the actual record was 13-3 and three, and your prediction was 13-4, and four, which obviously, you know, because of the um, what happened in the game against the Bengals, that game was, was cancelled. But at the time of the game ending, you were losing. So you could have really, you could have been spot on and got that right. But even, even so, you were still... You know, same amount of wins. So either way, you were one of our best predictions last year. I said it to Paul in our 49ers episode. I'm going to try and do a prize this year. So, um, all right. But I hope that this year is the year you get high again. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just mentioned the New York Jets, and they are to you playing week one on the road in New York on Monday Night Football, uh, win, loss, or tie. 
yeah, I've got that down as a win. Um, I think the Jets will get good, but I think if we're going to play them, play them early, and I think that the Bills will just be a better, well-oiled machine at that point in the season. Okay, and then week two is a home game, your first of the season against the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. Yeah, I think it's just a, a question of talent. I think the Bills are just a better football team. At first, uh, first game in Orchard Park, I think it's a, it's a win. Uh, speaking of Orchard Park, actually, we've got to mention this. Well, the new stadium is being built. Um, mm. like all the all the presentations about it this year. Uh, I know David fended the podcast. He went to that, um, and of course, it's meant it's due to um, be out in, or open. So I should say in twenty twenty six. What's your take? Are you happy to be getting a new stadium, or are you a little bit of you sad that you're leaving Orchard Park? Well, I mean, it's right across the street, so the place is the same. Uh, but this current stadium, you know, that third tier, the safety certificate only lasts so long. It is quite old, and it is starting to crumble. Um, it obviously has uh, massive sentimental value for me as someone who's been a fan since I was a teenager. Um, it's, it's a real a special place for me to go and watch uh, football games. But, uh, you know, every stadium has its life, and um, I think the Bills uh, are desperate for a new one. So um, there's a lot of debate about it. Should it be downtown? Should it have a roof on it? Nobody really wanted to pay for either of those things so we're across the street uh but i think it looks really nice i mean it's the same designers as the spurs stadium and you'll see if anyone's seen those sort of renderings a lot of similarities between what we see at spurs and uh the, what we're going to see in the bills the one slight complaint i have is it's going to be slightly smaller than the uh, the current stadium which is a bit of a weird thing but given stadiums are seemingly getting small smaller you and i have spoken i went to actually sofi um a couple of weeks ago and did a tour of that and it, i was surprised to see it was only 70 000 seats yes they can add more in terms of seat, uh, standing capacity Capacity, but um, yeah, stadiums are getting smaller, and um, but that's usually going to mean ticket prices are going to go up, which I think is is, is, is unfortunate. But um, yeah, I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be a nice stadium, and um, of course, there is some nostalgia for the current one. But yeah, not everything lasts forever. Yeah, I, I mean, I saw somewhere that I think not everyone, I think yeah, also the less capacity, which means that season tickets might be an issue for some people to re- to renew. Yep. It. But yeah, I think obviously it um, it looks nice, and I'm I'm hoping that. Um, it doesn't bring you guys too much joy, but um, yeah, it <laughs> and also I will plan to go to to try and keep my um my record of being to every active stage and going. I probably will go to the Dolphins game whenever they play the Bills. That first year, I, I will try and go there because I've made some good friends from Buffalo, and um, yeah, I look forward to going back there. Um, and now we're heading to your first of a three game straight stretch. You're seeing the Bills play live. So week mm. three is in Washington D.C. against the uh at, on the road against the Commanders. Yeah, I feel good about this one. I think just in case of quite, I always look at quarterbacks and yeah, you know, I think the commanders are still short of one, perhaps. I do think it's an actually a decent roster, but I think that uh, again from a talent perspective, I think the Bills have got the edge there and I expect that to be a win. Then week four is at home to the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, this one is a real a real tough one for me. Um, I think the Dolphins are going to be very, very competitive. I expect the Bills and Dolphins to to split um games this year, um, one win each. Um, normally I'd expect us to win the first one, uh, especially given it was at home, but actually I think it's going to go the other way this year. I, th- I suspect this Finns team is going to be very, very difficult to, to beat. And, um, I think that we also play on the last game, the last, uh, what is it? Weeks, week 18, I guess it is. Um, so I'm going to go the other way around. I think the bills are winning Miami and I think the Finns are winning, 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 uh, in Buffalo, which will be unfortunate given I'm there to see it, but, um, we can't going to win them all. So I suspect they're going to split and, uh, yeah, I've got the stands of loss. Hey, and then week five is the London game, uh, against the Jaguars. Yeah, I'm expecting that to be a win. Um, again, I think the Jags are really going to be a tough proposition this year. But again, I think we owe them one. We had a really bad loss against them a couple of seasons ago. Um, I think it'll be interesting. Obviously, the Jags will be in London for, for two weeks. It's a long time to be away from home. Um, and I suspect that might just give the Bills a little bit of an edge. Obviously, you might look at the other way and say, well, the Jags will be more acclimatized. But still, being out of your routine for a prolonged period of time is never, never a great thing. So, yeah, I've got that down as a, as a Bills win. And then week six against the Jets again. I don't think I've ever seen the two games against the Saint in the division being this early on, uh, the second lot of games. But it is at home against Jets. Yeah, so um, actually, no, Giants is next, I think. Giants. Oh, we have us. Well, yeah. Yeah. I must have, I've obviously put the Giants rather than the Jets. So, yeah, um, no worries. So I Giants say- is it? A- tricky one because obviously Brian Dable is the coach there former offensive coordinator of the Bills you know he knows us very well but I do think just from a pure talent perspective from a quarterback talent perspective the Bills are the 
the team. The Giants can be very, very tough, um, especially in their own stadium, but I expect that to be a win. Hey, and then week seven, it's a road game in Foxborough against the Patriots. I think the Patriots will be better this year. Well, they can't be much worse, can they? I mean, they actually have a grown-up running the offense this time, so that's going to be uh, an improvement. But it's still, still Mike Jones, a quarterback, and I'm skeptical as to how high, far he will take them. So I think it'll be tight, but I do think the Bills will win that one. Okay, and then week eight is a game I'm going to uh, at home against the Buccaneers. Yeah, so obviously the Bucks are a different proposition now. Brady's moved on. It's not quite the team that they uh, they thought. And, uh, you know, again, don't really have an answer at quarterback. So I've got that one on as a relatively comfortable win for the Bills. And then week nine is against a team that did knock you out of the NFL playoff last season away to the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, I've got this down as a loss. I think this is a tough one. I mean, I think that the the playoff game was a unique one-off situation where the Bills were in not great shapes for a variety of reasons. But actually, the more meaningful game was the the start of the game we saw against uh, against the Bengals, where Demar Hamlin. Um, had that that big issue and the Bills were not looking great against them. I do think that the, the Bengals match up very well against the Bills. So I've got that down as a loss. And then week 10 is at home to the Denver Broncos. Yeah, this is a win. I'm not a believer in Russell Wilson. I think that he may have just tripped over that, uh, that age issue. And um, I do also think that, that Sean Payton and him, may, but there may be some clashes there. So I'm not willing to see the Broncos as being uh, the second coming just yet. I've got that down as a win for the Bills. Hey, then week 11 is a game against the Jets that I thought was before. Um, <laughs> win, loss, or tie. <laughs> yeah, so I've got this one as a defeat. I think that the Jets will improve through the season. They did beat us without Aaron Rodgers last year. And uh, I think that, you know, these, these teams, the, the Dolphins, the Jets, and the Bills are relatively evenly matched. And I think that we'll split games and I think that we'll uh, lose them in, um, lose them in uh, New Jersey. Hey, and then before your week 13 bye week, is one of the hardest games you'll probably face all year um, on the road in Lincoln Financial Field against the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, it pains me to say it. I think this Eagles team is really good. And I also think it's a really bad matchup for the Bills. I just think they can attack you in so many different ways. Um, I think that they will, I think it'll be close, but I do think the Eagles will win that. I think being at home will give them that advantage. And obviously their, uh, their, uh, you know, their pass rush is fantastic. And I think if the Bills have a weakness, it's on the O-line. So um, I have that down as an Eagles win. Well, it doesn't get any easier um, because you have a bye week. Then you have the team that beat the Eagles in the Super Bowl last season, again on the road against the Chiefs. Well, the Bills have actually beaten the Chiefs on the road in the regular season twice in in um, in Arrowhead. So actually, I feel pretty good about this. Um, I think especially coming off a bye as well, I think the Bills will be well rested. And I actually think the Chiefs will have slightly dropped off whenever you've got Mahomes and you can never count them out. But I do think this is, uh, this is one I actually feel quite good about. Hey, and then week 15... Back at home for the first time since week 11 um, against Dallas Cowboys. I find this one a really tough one to call. I think this is a, a good Cowboys team. Um, we have, last time we played them, we actually beat them quite comfortably. It was a great game in uh, in Dallas. And I've got this down as a win, but it's tight. I could easily see this going the other way. Um, I think this Cowboys defense is really, really good. Um, but I just think on offense, I think the Bills going to have the edge. Hey, and then week 16... On the road against the Los Angeles Chargers at SoFi. Yeah, I got this as a, as a win. I, I think that the Chargers have got to show me that they can be what uh, they expect to be. I think that um, Herbert obviously is a really good quality quarterback, but they've never been able to really get it going around him. And so I still think they're a level below the best of the teams in the AFC. Okay. And then week 17, of course, you mentioned week 18 on the road to Dolphins. You mentioned that'll be a win. So your final game you're predicting is going to be the Patriots at home. Yeah, and I've got that as a win as well. I don't, I'm not a believer in this 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 Patriots team. I, I said they'll play everybody hard. I think the defense is really good, but in terms of just being able to go and win it, win a game against the best talent in the NFL, I'm not, I'm not believing in the Pats. I think this is probably a eight nine win team. Um, uh, but uh, so there's no mugs, but I don't expect them to to challenge the Bills, the Finns, or the uh, or the Jets uh, in the division. And I've got that down as a win. Okay, so that means, so that means that your prediction. It's 13 and 4, which means we move into our table of fan predictions. You currently have a time of recording the second biggest record prediction of our fans so far. Of course, Sam and Ollie are right at the bottom with their Cardinals with 6 and 11 and 5 and 12. And then you are third place is Javan with his 11 and 6 Seattle Seahawks record. And then you with 13 and 4, a second behind Paul Hope, who had his 49ers finishing 14 and 3. So, yeah, so far. You're you're one of the most confident fans of all the um all the teams, and I think that you know 
this isn't the only sport where your team's doing well. Of course, your football team, Man City, just won the treble. Um, now, I know we're not a football podcast, but just want to ask you about that because it is um, that must have been just some some few weeks for you. Yeah, it was incredible. Um, I was at um, I was at City to see them get the trophy, um, Premier League trophy, and then I was at Wembley to see them win the FA Cup against Man United, which obviously had you know uh, it wasn't just an FA Cup final; it was a Manchester derby FA Cup final. Uh, I didn't go out to uh, to Turkey to watch the the Champions League, uh, but obviously watched it, and uh, yeah, it was a fairly boozy night. I'll have to say I did go to uh, Bill's Backers Pub to watch that game, and I have to shout out the Fitzrovia Bell who pretty much funded my entire drinking that that whole night um as a sort of loyal loyal <laughs> patron um so they treated me very well and um yeah the hangover lasted a little while but no it was it was fantastic and um you know for us that have been supporting city for for well, getting on for 40 years um it's 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 quite it's pinch yourself stuff honestly um obviously there's a whole heap of controversy around city at the moment and um, that'll probably continue and for, for quite a while but if you just enjoy the football and you want to watch great players and you want to watch a really great coach uh, get the most out of that great players and then, then, it, then it's fantastic to watch so yeah an incredible few weeks and um i'm actually enjoying having some downtime i'm not watching uh watching football for a couple of months because it takes it out of you i mean you'll know when you're in a title run at the end the energy where you're watching your game and whoever actually competing their game and you know it feels like it's going to be touch and go touch and go all the time it just takes it out of you so i'm i'm happy to have a bit of downtime but uh, yeah incredible season and uh probably one we won't ever see again yeah, I mean, unlike the NFL, it's a short off season and it's a long, a long regular season. So it's um, yeah, it's um, yeah, I I can see why. I remember when we went for the quadruple, I was absolutely knackered by the end. I mean, it was you know, it because obviously my dad is also a local fan as well. So it's a case where I wanted to make sure I watched these big games with him because he's the one who basically made me a fan. So I remember I was living in Brighton at uni, so. I would. I went down for the FA Cup final, the last day of the Premier League season, and the Champions League final, all from Brighton to Wales. So I think that was like three and four weekends. I was down back home, making the, the four hour train journey from um from Brighton. So it's um yeah, I remember I'd be out being absolutely knackered, and then because of the World Cup happening, it seemed like just the next day the season was back. So it's um yeah, that's a good thing about the NFL in a way. Even though we all hate the long off season, the one positive about it is you can certainly get a, a rest from the sport and if you're a fan and you especially if you go to a lot of the games or like you went to the game of the Etihad and the FA Cup final and I know there's a fan out there that went to every single City game home and away that's it I saw that on Twitter all 64 games so yeah definitely it's a chance to um, recoup but I doubt I'm, I, I do I do find that the off-season is a little shorter for me because I pay a huge amount of attention to the draft. So as soon as the season's finished, I'm all into scouting mode and uh, I, that's what I focus on for a good couple of months. Um, but then once the draft is over, it really does get to start to drag. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I said, I, I'm even excited about preseason. I like to see the, the the players that are, you know, competing for roster spots um, out there on the field and see what we've got there. I'm, I'm, I'm really at that level in terms of paying attention to the team. So yes, I care about who the 53rd person is on this roster and uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's hard to kind of switch off from, but I am enjoying having a bit of a break. And of course, we'll get into fancy soon, right? So it won't be too long before we're all picking our fancy teams and uh, thinking about that. So um, yeah, we're getting closer. Of course, we did our um, well. I set the draft order for our second edition of our of our member of the Titans draft league, and um, yeah, you got the very last pick. Well, you got back to back picks, but even so, back to back picks is bad. You have no time. You got to I'm going to you got to prepare two picks ahead all the time. It, it that's, that's tough, honestly. As the but I did okay, I think in the in the league last year. I don't think I did too badly. So I can't even we'll remember see. what the um where you were. Finished out. I know Tom Bolton won it all, but I. Yeah, I can't remember where the hell you finished down. Who even he beat in the final? Did you make the playoffs? As yeah, definitely made the playoffs. Yeah, I was in the it was in the last few. I think I think oh. I got to the semi-finals from memory, something like that. I knew I knew I was competitive at least. So yeah, but we look forward to that once again this year. Um, but in the meantime, this will be where we end the podcast. So first of all, thank you once again, Charlie, for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. Anytime. Thanks, Andy. And we will obviously put this video up or this podcast out on social so if you haven't yet followed charlie on twitter make sure you do so as well and get his uh, followers up but in the meantime this has been the across the pod podcast i've been andy this has been charlie and we will see you guys next time